Tim said a long time ago, maybe in Galaxy, far, far away, that when you have interpretation of quantum mechanics, you should look hard at the math. And uh, so this talk is basically uh, hard to look at the math. And uh, particularly from my point of view as a mathematical logician in terms of some new developments in mathematical logic and what light they shed on quantum uh, mechanics. And I'm going to present it sort of as a gloss on Shimoni's, uh, what he called the literal interpretation of quantum mechanics or the objective indefiniteness. So the things you need to explain are objective indefiniteness and superposition. And uh, this is sort of a quote uh, from him saying we're subjective indefinite, it's not epistemic, and, and uh, this is what in the end needs to be elucidated. And this idea that there in quantum mechanics there is objective indefiniteness is, is a pretty common idea. I've lined up a bunch of quotes here from uh, people. Uh, Heisenberg, his notion of potentia. Heisenberg uh, was very had very little self-confidence talking about philosophy, so he always couched it in terms of discussing ancient Greek philosophy. And so he had Aristotle, potentia, and actuality. And so his notion of potentia, which I'll also comment on later, was basically a, a superposition to objectively indefinite state. You've got Mittelstadt, uh, Feyerabend, and, and a whole bunch of others. Uh, Alan Stair's notion of a disjunctive fact is very immediate, sort of like the fact that where none of the disjuncts are true, there are, are, are facts, it's a superposition. So the thing here is to try to uh, give a account of what it, of objective indefiniteness in, in quantum mechanics and to say what is the proper mathematical formalism which highlights this this notion of objective indefiniteness. And uh, so I'm going to take sort of two different approaches. The main approach is number two, uh, through partitions, because that's, that's the sort of new mathematics that's developed is, is a, a development of the logic of partitions and the concepts that come out of the logic of partitions. And, and uh, the, uh, whether the wave function is, in fact, the proper thing to look at. The, the wave function sometimes thought of as in terms of indebtedness, the way in front is hitting the two slits and the double slit experiment and so in some sense it's uh, indefinite between the two, but is that really the best mathematics? So by the end of the talk, uh, I will try to answer the question, what's the best mathematics in which to frame quantum mechanics that gives you the direct interpretation in terms of indefiniteness, which wave function doesn't, doesn't do? So let's start out with a very simple example from a strand. This is a knowledge, this is not a, this is not a rigorous argument in this part. And uh, suppose your universe consists of these, these four uh, figures. And, and uh, so you have this equilateral triangle, and you have three isosceles right triangles, and you want to have uh, the notion of, of an isosceles right triangle independent of the length of the size, independent of scale here. And uh, so how do you mathematically represent this combining of, of the three uh, isosceles right triangles so that you abstract away from the length of the size. What's the proper mathematical form in which to do that, as opposed to just the set of the three? So let's start off with the set of those three things, U2, U3, U4. And if you want to just represent that set, normally you would have a, just a, a vector of those uh, three elements out of the four. But it turns out if you uh, use two dimensions, uh, use the notion of incidence matrix from combinatorics, then you can represent the difference between just the set of the three things and this combined concept of we're abstracting from that and saying that this is the isosceles right triangle independent of length. So you blurred out or, or smooshed out or smeared out the, the differences in the length. And uh, that's uh, the way to do it is if you just want to represent the set, the independent set where there's no uh, uh, blurring out or blobbing out of uh, the difference between the two, then you have the diagonal matrix with those three elements in it. And so that's the instance matrix of the diagonal. And then if you want to represent the, the, the sort of the, in this case would be the, as it were, associated right triangle independent of the length of the sides, then you would have this, this thing there at the bottom 
which is the instance matrix of S cross S. So it's, it's uh, uh, blocked out. And the off-diagonal uh, elements, the, the key thing here is to interpret the off-diagonal elements. They say we're ignoring the differences between you know, the two things that are, that are, of which is the off-diagonal element. So between those three things, what do we know the differences? The only differences are the lengths and size. So we're going to capture with this mathematical uh, framework that thing which is independent of lengths and size. In other words, the isosceles triangle in this universe. So uh, yeah, the, the isosceles triangle. And you say, well, this this notation works. And this mathematical work, notation works. It should be the same if you only have one element. So if you have one element then there's no, nothing to extract from, you get the same element back, and you see it works, because one element in either notation is just the matrix of one uh, diagonal element, but the representations differ between, between the two. So the off-diagonal elements, the, the interpretation here is that they are, uh, you're, you're, you're blurring out, you're smearing out, you're bobbing, you use whatever your terminology you want, of the differences between them. And that's the idea that I want to and this is simply an example from representing different types of abstraction. Now, the, the uh, we'll go on there. The, the point here is that everything you do with subsets, you can do with these abstracted uh, subsets as well. You can do Boolean algebra, you can, you can so you'd have you know, the S thing for the subset S, you'd have the T thing for the subset T, and you can find then all the Boolean operations on those using this notation. You might say, well, I don't have any intuitive idea you know, what the, the T thing is or the S thing for those subsets, but that doesn't matter. We're not talking about intuition, we're talking about math. And you use this sort of matrix representation to do that, as you can define Boolean algebra. And, 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 you can, and if you can do Boolean algebra, of course, say in the finite case, you can also do probability theory where your events are not subsets. That would be just the diagonal works. They are these, these sort of universal abstractions and universal abstractions, and a new probability theory for that. Okay, so now we move uh, to instant matrices. You just divide through by the, the uh, uh, trace, and, and then you have, in each case, a uh, density matrix. And everything you're doing with the probabilities, you can, in fact, do with the density matrices. You just have to, uh, it, it represents all the relevant information you see, and you can do all the stuff you did with uh, finite discrete probability theory using these density matrices. And when you use that second version of the density matrix, the S cross S, in effect you're doing probability theory with these sort of abstract versions of the subsets, not the subsets themselves. It's, so uh, that's a bit just later on. David, can I, I'm sorry. I just want to understand something. And maybe it's just a, a feature of the example. Right. Um, if I wanted to deal with triangles that are abstracting off the scale, you know, what like Julian Martin and so on, sure. my thought would be to go from my original thing where I represent a triangle by giving you three pieces of data, three lengths, sides, and lengths, or something like two, which is one side and two angles, to one where I just give you two pieces of data, give you two angles. And then, and then everything's normal, you know, every, every different shape corresponds, you know, I have a two-dimensional state, state space. Yeah, but what I'm saying is if you go one turtle down where, where your, your triangles do have links, how do you move up to a more abstract level where you ignore the links? Just, 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 just that way. Every, every triangle that had links also has three angles. Yeah. And I just, and I and just... So how, how mathematically do you represent this process of of uh, combining the ones that have different links into one, you know, the isosceles right triangle. Well, it, it, it's as if, uh, how can I put this? So, suppose um, the, the, the situation is when I have the full triangles, the, the convention is I represent them by side, and, uh, angle, side, angle. So I have three pieces of data. Now, there's a, a, it's a bit subtle because then there'd be the equivalence classes but, okay. And then I say, oh, you're not interested in the size? Okay, I mean, instead of these three pieces of data, just drop one, right? Just drop the last one, drop the, I mean, the side one, and, 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 and work with the pairs of angles. Yeah, I mean, if, if, 
Mathematically, you, you can, if you start, you can just say, I'll, I'll start with three angles or two angles on the side and so forth. But, but I'm saying, if you start with the uh, universe where you have the ones that differ only in size, then you can conceptualize moving up one level of abstraction mm -hmm. and saying, I'm going to take the thing which is definite on what is common to the three things and indefinite on what is different. And what's different is the length and size. So what's common is that they're all isosceles right triangles. And, that's, and this is a mathematical framework that will represent that. And of course, we're going to see later on this is a mathematical framework that works in quantum games. That's the whole point. Okay. So here's another example. Take a, uh, a die and the, the uh, diagonal matrix, six by six diagonal matrix with one sixth down the each element in the diagonal is, as, as quoting here from the book on quantum mechanics, that represents the Cisco mixture uh, state of the classical die uh, before the outcome of the throw. So what would be this number two interpretation, the other interpretation, and that's where you would, you would, you would uh, combine, to, as, it, as it were, just to start using uh, quantum mechanical uh, terms, the indefinite superposition so what, rather than having six different uh, outcomes of throwing the die, you have the outcome of throwing the die, but it's indefinite between one through six. And so you, you look at my little example there. I superimpose, superimpose the uh, six numbers. And, and so then the outcome of the die would be represented as sharpening this indefinite representation of the side into one of the specific rather than picking out from the set of specific ones the one that actually comes out of the throw. So you have a different representation of the random event of throwing a die. So it's either you know, picking something randomly out of that first set of all well, the same things, or taking the representation of the uh, the outcome and sharpening it. The probability one six of one of those outcomes. So uh, and, and as I mentioned, you, you can just reformulate find a discrete probability theory uh, doing that. And the, the uh, sort of essence of the story as we jump to quantum mechanics is these all diagonal elements. They represent the objective indefiniteness as, as uh, this quote here from the same uh, book. The all diagonal elements represent quantum coherences. So it means you're taking those two things that are connected by that off-diagonal element and you're cohering them together, smooshing them uh, together, rendering them, rendering their differences indefinite and, and uh, yet to be sharpened uh, in, in the future. So now I'm switching to the other approach, and, and uh, this is the more fundamental approach, the new mathematics that's developed uh, using partitions and seeing how it gives us the, the uh, conceptual, conceptual concepts or categories uh, to deal with, with quantum mechanics. So uh, it started off with uh, taking classical logic. Classical logic is, is, should, should be formulated, although the texts don't do that anymore, uh, as the Boolean logic of subsets. The so-called propositional logic is a special case, or as it were, you take the universe set to be two elements, and, or no, one element, and then you have a, the set to the empty set, so it's called true or false. But the mathematically correct way to do it is, is to take the Boolean algebra subsets. And around the middle of the 20th century, we had the development of category theory, and that really nailed down this fundamental notion of duality. So the dual of a subobject, or in this case a subset, is a quotient object or a quotient set, and a quotient set is a covert relation or a partition. So that tells you if you have this whole logic of subsets, then, then you should have a, a corresponding sort of dual form of logic, which is a logic of partitions. So the things that you're manipulating are not subsets in interpretation, they are partitions of, of, of the universe set. And uh, so this did not come out of the usual formulation in the textbooks where uh, they define uh, propositional logic is having only the variables having only two values, and uh, there's no categorical dual then. So, so the whole idea of having a dual logic didn't seem to occur to people because all the textbooks said we're starting with propositional logic, only two possible values. So the 
the notion of, say, tautology is not the truth table notion of tautology. It's the notion that no matter what subsets of the universe set, you substitute for the variables, the whole uh, formula will evaluate to the universe set. And then that's, that's the definition of a uh, conventional tautology. And then there's the theorem, which Boole was well aware of, that if you only restrict it to the one element set, you'll get the, the same set of valid formulas. And so then all the textbooks just sort of stick to that special case and make the definition of a, of a tautology as a truth table tautology, rather than saying that's a theorem based on the broader definition. That's why no one seems to have said, well, even though we've known about category theory and duality since the early mid 20th century, uh, where is the alternative logic? So. Uh, the alternative logic is logic of partitions. The uh, logical operations of meet and join were defined uh, on partitions in the 19th century by Dedekind and, uh, and others. And uh, in the early development of lattice theory, that was a standard example of the uh, lattice of partitions on a, just even say, three element set is, is non distributed. And so when Charles Sanders Pierce published in uh, somewhere in the late 19th century that he had a theorem to prove that all lattices are distributed, but Dedekind and Schroeder and all the European mathematicians jumped all over it and says, no, no, you've got to look at the lattice of partitions. It's not distributed. It's a perfectly good lattice. And because uh, we have join and meet uh, partitions defined. And uh, throughout the 20th century, nobody ever defined another operation on partitions. It was an amazing uh, lack of attention. This, so the real key to uh, developing the full logic partitions was learning how to define, say, implication. What's the implication operation of two partitions? And, that, and then that opens up, and you can do the whole field. So here is sort of a uh, representation at a very abstract sort of logical level of what uh, two different types of ontology suggested by these two different logics. So the classical ontology here, which are all the notion, all the uh, entities A, B, and C in your universe are all perfectly discrete, or perfectly well-defined, definite. And the question is, do they exist or not? So each subset is specified uh, by what elements are in that subset. So it's, it's elements and subsets. But in the dual logic, the logic of uh, partitions, is sort of the opposite. You have, like all the, use philosophical terms, you have like all the substance there, but at the bottom, all the substance is smooshed together. So there's no differentiation between A and C. It's one block uh, of the partition. And then you start making distinctions. So here's, here you make a distinction between B and AC. But AC is still in the superposition, as it were. And so there's no, uh, no distinction between A and C. That comes later. So here is the top where you have a full uh, set of distinctions that have, have been made. And so then your, your uh, blocks in your partition are all one element sets. And of course, this is anticipating the, the uh, quantum case where you have a mixed state of one-dimensional spaces and fully, fully decoherent uh, things. So this tells you that the language is not uh, elements in existence, but it's what distinctions have been made. So it's distinctions and indistinctions, distinguishability, indistinguishability. So those are the basic. If, if, if uh, those are the basic concepts that turn out to apply uh, to the mathematics of quantum theory. And so this tells you that in some sense we can work in the wrong ontology here of, of fully definite things and that quantum theory actually belongs on the other side where the basic concepts are what is distinguished, what is not distinguished, and, and uh, this is how we're going to eventually build up the definition of superposition and objective indefiniteness. David, hey, because this is new to me, could you just say what the join and meet operations are on yeah. the yeah. yeah. So the, the important one is, is the join. So if you have a, uh, and then the join of the two partitions is the set of bi intersect c 
J, they're not empty. Okay. So what idea should you have in your mind? The idea you should have in your mind is that we have two direct sum decompositions of the vector space, and then you're then which are eigenspaces, spaces, of course, and then you do the same operation on those sub eigenspaces. spaces. So what are the elements in here? In that case, use the simultaneous eigenvectors from those two things. And so that's the joint operation, pseudo joint operation when we get to direct sum decompositions. And so we so just switch intersection with union, yes? Uh, no. <laughs> no. The, the, uh, it's, it's a little more complicated, but, but the, the point is that the, uh, the, these are, this is, this is the, uh, if you do the refinement worry. So refinement, uh, let's say, I refines sigma if, this definition actually, for all B in pi, there exists a C in sigma such that B is contained in C. So refinement means that, that you can, you can uh, uh, it's like taking the, the blocks in C and splitting them up to get the blocks in B. There's no, no uh, nothing overlaps part of two different blocks. Is, is, it, is there some reason, I mean, for that, I just want to make sure I'm not missing something. I always thought meeting drawing on a lattice are kind of intuitively very easy, right? I, I take two elements. I, I ask if I go up on the lattice, what's the first one yeah, that yeah. they both get to? And if I go down on the right. lattice, what's the highest one where they exactly. So that just them? tells you that's and that's that's all. Well, that's a very definition. simple definition, right? Is there some reason to be doing something? Yeah, because well, when, when your elements, your lattice or or partitions, then how do you define the partition? That's the meter of the joint. So this is how you define, if you do the uh, refinement order in this way, this is how you define the joint. And, and bear in mind that most of the older texts talked about the lattice of partitions, like Birkhoff's book on the lattice theory, and they use the opposite order. So if you want to find this construction in Birkhoff, it's called the meter. So you turn it around. So they really weren't doing the lattice of, of uh, Partitions are doing the lattice of coach relations. You see, each, if you have the universe, then the, the, there's two sets to look at. Given a partition, let's say uh, B is our, and you want to talk about the Pogon's relation, then that's the sum, um, and that's a subset. So that's the Pogon's relation as a binary relation on this set of. Uh, U cross U, and this is what we would call the indistinctions of the partition. So the indistinctions, things that are not distinguished over pairs that are in the same block. So blocks are how you distinguish things by having different blocks. So if you have a random variable, then you're in the same block, you've got the same type. So you're not distinguished by that random variable. So this is what we call the indent set, indistinction. And the complement is the set of distinctions. And this is what turns out to be the more relevant concept. So this is the set of word pairs that are in distinct blocks. So this is a measure of how much this partition distinguishes things. It's how big this set is. So I'm eventually going to get to a notion of logical entropy, which, which, which is just a normalized uh, uh, measure of this, but so this is these are called index sets are called equivalent relations. This is called an apartment simulation in computer science or mathematics because it's the binary relation that tells you how to park things are. And you can you know it's it's uh, irreflexive with uh, transient and so forth. It's got certain characteristics and. Uh, when you, when you have these notions, in this set, in this set, you also have a notion of closure. See, when you have a set of topology on you have a notion of closure. But every, logically, there's a notion of closure on a set here, and that's the symmetric, reflexive symmetric transit closure, right? 
So that, once you have a notion of closure, then you have a notion of interior. Interior is the complement of the closure of the complement. Even though this closure relationship is not topological. Otherwise, this whole logic would just reduce down to intuitions to logic, which it doesn't. So you ask, how do you define the mean? Well, the, you define it by the dense set, for example. So just think of the dense set as if it was like a subset. So the mean of two subsets is the intersection. So you take the intersection. Dense set of five intersect the dead set of sigma. That's not a dead set. So you take the interior. The interior is the complement of the closure of the complement. And the closure is reflexive symmetric transit closure, which is defined every set, no topology assumed, and so forth. So this is where we're not doing intuition logic. So that's the dead set of, of the meat, and then you just you can take its complement and get the equivalent relation of the meat defined by the meat, and then unpack exactly what the meat is. And it will turn out to be the great flow of boundaries in the refinement of the world. OK. Decomposition, well, you're using projection operators. 
what's the characteristic of projection operator? Is it assigned to potent? And now we don't have operators yet. So what is the corresponding thing to idempotent is a characteristic function. It's a characteristic function of the only functions that are idempotent. So values are 0, 1, and those are the two numbers which multiply times themselves, gives you got themselves. So here is the spectral decomposition of a function. The, here's your eigenvector. This is your thing that's, that's idempotent. The characteristic function, the inverse image of R. So a element u comes in here, gets a, gets a 1 only on the inverse image of r, then multiply that r times 1, you get the function. So we have taken the notion of spectral decomposition down just to the level of sets, which allows, allows us to sort of start to see what's going on, even in a very simple situation with sets. <clears throat> And you can, of course, reformulate all these things we're doing now with sets using, what I said, the, the, these uh, uh, in, uh, density matrices, which are very classical. And the off-diagonal elements tell you when things are in the same block, in this case. And so then the question is, can we do a model, pedagogical model, or so-called toy model, quantum mechanics at the level of sets? And it turns out that's entirely possible. And the trick is you're, you're taking the base field not to be complex numbers, but to be Z2. So you're working in the space Z2 in to the nth power is your, is your uh, underlying vector space. And you want to be able to represent a good bit of the quantum phenomena at that level. Now this, of course, is an old idea. and the uh, trick is to know what to keep and what not to keep from standard form mechanics when you try to do a toy model at the level of sets or at any other, any other level. And the, the great philosopher Kenny Rogers says you've got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And so what was usually done before, like by Schumacher and Westmoreland, when they did this, they, their idea was you take the notion that the direct bracket takes its values in the base field, and they consider that a hand to hold, and they got out just something which only has two values, 0, 1, and for the brackets, and they, they said this is just impossibility of possibility. So this is, their, they call it modal, modal uh, model, modal quantum case, which is completely nowhere. So instead of taking the idea that the direct brackets have to take values in the base field, take the idea that the direct brackets are the overlap. And then figure out how do you extend the notion of overlap to sets. Well, that's pretty obvious. It's the, it's the part out in the intersection of the sets. So if you define the direct bracket that way, it doesn't take values in the base field, that's OK. All that will get rolled into the base field as you get back to the complex numbers. But we're doing everything over Z. And so, that's your definition of the brackets is here. And when you do that, it turns out you can get a fairly uh, sophisticated toy model of quantum mechanics, and uh, which I call quantum mechanics over sets, because your vectors are just sets. You know, the vector is 0, 1, because you're in this space here. But it's non commuting It's got different bases. So how do you know you've got something interesting as opposed to garbage? You just fix the basis. When you fix the basis, you get out standard finite probability theory. That is on both. This is going hard to fast for me. When you say you're using z2 to the n as your vector space, is it a real or complex vector space? No, it's, it's a vector space over finite field. And your addition is mod 2. So a plus a is zero. So that's, oh, that, that so you get it's it's neither real nor complex. You, you, no, no, you just think it's not going to be real or complex. It's a whole field of finite, finite. That's what, you know, combinatorics and a lot of communication and coding theory all uses these vector spaces of a finite field. So this is well developed stuff. This is this particular. So you get interference and all that going on, but it's your addition is mod 2, because you're working in C, C2. So, so 
This model of quantum mechanics, it allows you uh, to do, for example, so it's a pedagogical model. So you can actually represent something like the double slit experiment, you know, the user results. You can represent the Heisenberg, what's usually misnamed Heisenberg uncertainty principle, if it's a question of certainty, which is an epistemological question, it's the Heisenberg indefiniteness principle, which is the correct translation. That can be represented here. And uh, the basic thing is you can even do Bell's theorem. Yes. Can, can you give me a sketch just for two slit? I mean, the thought is, if I have a vector space over the wheels or over the complex, then you know I've, I've got this sine square. Or, you know, I, I have these continuous functions right. that represent the the densities in the in the interference. And if it's over Z two, how does that work? The the uh, well, first of all, you got to bring in dynamics, and so yeah, the dynamics to do two slit, sure. <laughs> So the, the corresponding dynamics is just non-zero linear transformation over the vector field Z2. So you don't, so states are being, as it were, switched from one basis to another, but they're never being switched together, which is the corresponding thing. You I'm, 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 I'm just not, I, I, I'm, I'm asking a, a, a much simpler question. No, I'm just saying to do, obviously, something like the double slit experiment, we need to have uh, a dynamics, because the particle as it were has to go from the screen that or the split thing back to the screen. But, uh, okay, I'm, I'm asking a much simpler question. If, if the only values right. that the things can take are zero and one and these are not to arithmetic, uh, I guess I can see how you can say I can get destructive, complete destructive interference because when a one and a one come together, I think they wipe each other out. Not quite sure how you get so constructive this, interference because when a one and a one together come together, they wipe each other out. I mean, it's like all I can ever get is destructive interference, and I, and I can only get it in this very you know uh, discrete thing. So how do I get the just you know the normal yeah. sine square? Sure, take take the take the. Uh, Simple case of, of a universe of uh, three elements, and and so there be many other bases uh, of this, and and so you can think of this as a computational basis, and you express other bases in terms of this computational basis if you want. So the idea is that you have a dynamic, say A transforms into A B, B transforms, so C transforms into B. C, and I think C is that I have to go back and look at the, the paper. And then you have the two slits. And you just use these as simple spatial. This is A, B, and C. And over here you have your same spatial thing, sort of one time period later. And then you do your your uh, transformation. Say that it takes one one time period, and what will happen is when it goes through the two slits, that A will go to superposition of A B, C will go to the superposition of B C, and the B's will cancel. It's right, that gives you this zero one contrast. I'm asking yeah, for so all you, the intermediate, you know, the well, obviously you're not going to get smooth curves. We're doing it over, then you over zero one. In a normal sense, you're not getting two slits. I mean, I mean, this might be good for doing quantum computation, but you know, two slits. No, it's, it's not doing quantum computation. It's not the two slit experiment. It's showing that the logic between the case where you measure and the case which you don't can all be brought out, and you get the sort of. So when you said you can do two slits, you didn't mean I can use this for a model that will recover the predictions of a two slit experiment. It'll recover the difference between the toy model. Yeah, it's a toy model. You recover the difference between when there's monitoring at the slits and when there isn't. It's a toy model analog of the two slits. Huh? We say it's a toy model analog of the two slits. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Very toy. Cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's, it's <laughs> all the <ultimate, laughs> simplicity. It's a fact that you can get out of that little theorem and all that at this level of simplicity is very simple. Well, that's this. I can relate this to the double slit. You have you have A and C and then two slits right. or not. Yeah? Yeah. And A, B, C are uh, three possible outcomes. These are spatial coordinates, and this is the same spatial coordinates one time period later. Yes. And so uh and so you have this, this flashes 
these errors represent. Uh, they, they represent A, uh, B, it, it is uh, interference uh, because you, are, you have two possible outcomes. Either you have interference or you have no interference. Yeah. So, and so when A goes to A, it is no interference, mm -hmm. and C goes to C. Well, I, I, I cannot relate um, this with, uh, I, I, I have problem to understand what you represent up and what you represent here. So A goes to A, it means that there is no interference. No, the, the, I'm, I'm representing the case where you don't have monitoring at the slits. So you see the unitary uh, beginning this non-singular uh, evolution. So A propagates into the superposition of A and B, C propagates into the superposition of B and C, and the A B plus B C equals A C. And there's your interference. So you get out these bands coming out. So this represent A B plus B C is the case of interference. Yeah. The B's are the where it interferes. And all the interference here is obstructing because it's addition mod two. So you got the concept of the, of the double split experiment, but of course you're not doing the actual double split experiment. It's a pedagogical model. So you will find that all of the results of quantum mechanics can be represented in such a, a, a length by this model. By this. Not well. All the results, of course not. It's representing some of the key points, like the double slit experiment, the difference between where you monitor or you measure the slits and when you don't. And we'll you can you can represent the the uh, you know, Bell's theorem here. You can, you can do uh, you know uncertainty, indefiniteness principle, and so forth. You can do distinguishable and indistinguishable particles. It all it all works here. And so you, you bring out the basic concepts pedagogically in a very simple context. So it's a toy model. And, and uh, so from our point of view, it is, it is as you see the sort of indefiniteness coming out, the mathematics of indefiniteness coming out at a very simple level, totally a simple level. And, and this, is, this is published. I mean, you can download the paper from my website. And, and uh, it was hard to get it published because I submitted it to the journal Philosophy of Science, and uh, the editor sent it out to somebody who does work in quantum probability. And he said, oh, I see what's going on. He's just embedding this uh, space here, uh, Z2M, into the usual uh, C2C, the end power, and uh, making it so that they just hits those states which have zero or one coefficients. Oh, I see what's going on. Oh, but that doesn't work because you cannot embed a, a field, a finite characteristic, into a field of zero characteristic, obviously, because finite characteristic means you add the thing and then you zero. So they reject the paper. Of course, that's not what I'm doing. I never read the paper. And, and so I ended up publishing it in the Civil Peace, which seems to publish anything. Okay. So. The, the, uh, you can then uh, represent measurement in this context. So we take another numerical attribute, G, and that generates, as before, a, a, uh, its inverse image gives us a normal partition, and we have the joint partition, and we can represent those in these uh, density matrices. And so how do you, when you start off with this, uh, density matrix, and then you say, I want to impose on this the distinctions of sigma, the distinctions of this other numerical attribute of G. How does it change the density matrix to go to the density matrix where we only make the distinctions, the, or we make the, the indistinctions, the off diagonal elements are all the things that are, that are indistinctions of pi, and then we impose the additional distinctions of sigma. So we're going to get a much more refined, you know, we were here, much more refined 
partition because now we're distinguishing both by phi and by sigma. And how do you represent in this toy model that operation of going from this density matrix to this density matrix? Well, it's precisely the Luders mixture combination. The usual one just restated in this context. So this is a very rich toy model that can represent the result of measurement on these very simple objects of zero one. And that's all in that paper that, that, that I mentioned. So the, the uh, interesting thing here is, well, what are the distinctions that are made? When you do the projections in, in the Luders mixture operation, what does the projection do to the density matrix? Well, if the, if the off-diagonal element connects two things that are of the same eigenvalue, it just transmits it through. If the off-diagonal element connects two states of different eigenvalues, it's zero state. Because one of the, you know, the, the projection won't keep up, and then you're adding, adding it up over all these projections. And that's exactly what goes on here. So the only, uh, as it were, indistinctions that are preserved are the ones that are indistinctions in both things. If you're distinguished by one or the other, then you're distinguished in the joint. Yeah, by the way, the did set definition here is did set pi join sigma is just the union that it says. Because the union of its sets is always a dead set. Because the dead set is just the set complement of the equivalence relation, and the intersection of equivalence relations is always an equivalence relation. So, so, that's, so we're just showing how, this very simple level, we have none of the complications of, of full, full blown quantum mechanics. We're just dealing with basic concepts of distinctions and indistinctions, where we're already seeing how much of the actual mathematical machinery, concepts, even including measurement and all that come out in this toy model. This model. So, uh, as I mentioned, the, the uh, Lunar's mixture operation uh, just knocks out, zeroes out any non-zero off-diagonal element that, that now corresponds to different eigenvalues as it were of the new the, the uh, thing that you're measuring, in this case, G. It's the numerical attribute G. So now the question is, can we quantify this operation? Because we have a, you know, each, each partition is rep on the set is represented by a dead set. The dead set is the uh, set of set of, uh, now, your, now your universe is finite, your set of distinctions, so let's normalize it. Do you remember back when I was doing uh, Boolean logic, the key notions were elements and which elements exist. When you're doing partition logic, the key notion is distinctions and which distinctions are made by a condition or not. But to get to probabilities, from a subset, you now normalize it. So let's take the set of distinctions and normalize it here. Then you just work it through because the complement to the dead set is just the, the uh, union of the blocks times the blocks. And you, you get this, but this is obviously like the probability of a point falling into this block. And uh, so it's really the classical formula then for this notion of entropy coming right out of the logic of partitions. And the, the idea here is that what probability is to subsets, information is to partitions, which is an old idea. Uh, you get this. So what is the interpretation of this? Well, it's, it's just that if you do two independent draws from the underlying set, it's a probability of getting distinction. Because the sum of the probability squared is, is a probability of getting an indistinction, or it's getting a point that's in the same block. So you take one minus that sum, you'll get this. And then when you reformulate using density matrices, you get it's, it's one minus the trace of the squared. 
And that, of course, is, gives us a quantum mechanical version of logical entropy as well. <clears throat> so this gives us a new approach to shadow entropy. And uh, new foundations for information theory. I've talked about this in, in Split, but uh, this notion is the fundamental notion of, I use the word entry, but, but obviously uh, that was a bad decision that Shannon made to call this thing entry. It's not related to thermodynamic entry in any, in any direct way. And the relationship to Boltzmann's combinatorial formula is only by numerical approximation, so that's not the same functional form at all. So I, you can just as well call this the logical information content of a partition, uh, if you wish. And uh, it gives you a new notion of information theory. This notion of information theory uh, contrasts a lot. It gives you the sort of foundations for the Shannon theory. And the, there is a monotonic transformation from logical entry to Shannon entry that essentially substitutes for the distinctions, which are called dits bit set, uh, bits. So you have like a dip bit transformation. So you take all the formulas, uh, the simple entropy of a partition, the joint entropy of two partitions, the conditional entropy of two, the mutual entropy, and the logical level, you apply the dip bit transform and you get all the Shannon definitions precisely. Now, when, when Dragan gave his talk yesterday, he pointed out that the Shannon notion satisfied the Venn diagrams. Remember that? Venn diagram thing. But over the years, see, Venn diagrams don't fall out of the sky. They relate to measures. Venn diagram is usually it's a counting measure, but it automatically applies to a measure. So Shannon designed his definitions of, of all these different types of entry, conditional, joint, simple, mutual. Uh, so they satisfy the Venn diagram, but there's no set. It's not a measure. It's called a measure routinely. It's not a measure. Nobody's ever been able to find a measure uh, that this is a measure on that set. Whereas logical entry is a measure. I just told you what it was. It's, it's, the, it's the product of the probabilities. It's the probability that in two independent draws you'll get a distinction. In two independent draws you'll get on here. So it's a product. It's a product probability measure on U cross U. So the Venn diagrams apply naturally to logical entry because it's a measure. It's always between zero and one, and never equal to one, because you always have those, those diagonals that nothing can be distinguished from itself. And when you, when you do the dip bit transform, which I can go into later if you want, then that preserves Venn diagrams. So that explains why the Shannon is being satisfied Venn diagrams, but it's not a measure. Then there's a whole bunch of other cases where logical entry is mathematically fine and the Shannon entry breaks down. Uh, the most striking one is when you take three random variables. As Dragon pointed out, this nice property that uh, if your two random variables are independent, then the, there's zero overlap between those two circles, the Shannon in, in that sort of pseudo Venn diagram. So you can say, well, that's nice. So you, so you get, uh, there's no, uh, information in common if it's, okay, that's fine. So let's go to the three random variables. Now, in every piece of probability text, what is the example to tell you what is the notion of independence extended to three random variables? And the first, the first idea people have is, well, it's paralyzed independent. No, not true. And so, one of the standard example is you have you throw a die one at a time, x equals the uh, die one is odd, y is die two is odd, and z is die one plus die two is odd. These are pairwise independent. They're not mutual. Because if you're given a two, you've got the third. So how do you draw the Venn diagram for Shannon entropy if you've got three circles and each pair of circles has to be disjoint? But that since the three are dependent, they have the three have to intersect. 
Anybody know how to draw that Venn diagram? Bromine rings. <laughs> so the way you, here's the way you do it. We get, this is H of X, H of Y, H of Z. This is plus one, plus one, plus one, and this is minus one. That's the only way you can do it. So we say that things are disjoint, but we mean this numerically that the overlap is zero. And this is what you have. So each overlap is zero, but they all intersect, so you have a representation of mutual totals. So the Shannon notion, and nobody ever knows what the hell is negative information. Now we know what negative information is. But Shannon never defined mutual information for three variables. It was only people said, well, it's a Venn diagram, so you have a natural extension as in any measure for three, four, you know, using the inclusion exclusion principle. And that was independently done by several people. But Shannon never did it, and he never did it because he knew it was going to make it. You know, standard, standard example. This is the example used in Feller's book, for example. Feller, William Feller being a great creation of probability theory. You know who's creation is? William Feller? Oh, I don't know, but I came up to the name of the... Uh, I didn't know. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, but the... So, uh, you throw the die, and, and you uh, ask that the first, the first time it's us, the second time no, it's us. I'm saying that this is the, the you know, zero one. Yes. It's a binary random variable, and it's one of its odd, it's zero, it's even, and so on. So, uh, and uh, Z, the sum of, of two yeah. and so on, does not correspond, it can, um, cannot overlap with, with the X and Y, because R plus R uh, it gives... Uh, yeah, with the numerical values of uh, R. How, how can you relate? This X, Y, Z with what you represented with V, D, diagram. Because these are these are pairwise independent. Yes. Yeah. So that means the, the overlap has to be zero between the, the chance three circles for each one. Yes. Yeah. But the three are not mutually independent, they're dependent. Because if you know any two, you get the third. What are the so numbers? Plus one. This, this was odd, these two are odd, and this would have to be even and so forth. Yeah. So you get two, you get the values between two, you get the third. And this is you know, the standard example in the probability textbook of why you can't generalize mutual independence by just saying parallels. Uh, what I don't, don't understand that what we represent by minus one there is overlap between x, y, and z. It is. And uh, is x, y? Is, there's no overlap between x being odd, equal, uh, y being odd, and z being as a sum of the two being well, that, that's, that, that's what I'm completely lost. That, that it cannot, the tree cannot be satisfied in the same time, and here in the big diagram, where it's written minus one. But in, in Shannon, actually, whenever the random variables are not independent, then you have to have an overlap between the circles. And, and, and when they are independent, you have zero overlap. And it turns out when you have three random variables in this situation, you still have, here's your, this is your mutual dependence, it's minus one. Because you have zero overlap with each pair, but the three are dependent. Just work at it, you can just, you can compute the chat memory, all these cases, I'm just skipping the computation. This is standard computation, some of the earliest books on information theory and so forth. But, but, so I'm not trying to knock Shannon entry. Shannon entry is, is the right notion of entry for coding theory. Mm -hmm. and, and the fundamental, the fundamental sort of fact is that if you take the average uh, length of a code word, uh, so probably this is the code word for the i message, and this is the probability i message, this is always, uh, greater than or equal to the Shannon entry of this random variable which had these probabilities. So it's the minimum, it's the smallest of any coding, any coding scheme, it's the smallest average code length. And usually, depending on your random variables in your code alphabet, you can't reach it. Sometimes you can reach it. That's the significance of Shannon. So I'm not knocking Shannon entry, I'm just saying mathematically, 
it falls apart at the edges. It falls apart as soon as you get three. Or say, say you go out to finite, say you have the uh, you have a countable distribution, uh, countably infinite distribution. Shannon entry can blow up. Logic entry cannot blow up because it's you know, one minus the sum of the pi squared. And if, if the sum of the pi's is one, then certainly the sum of the pi squares is perfectly well defined. And it will never blow up. Similarly, when you do the, you know, the, the when you take uh, for continuous probability distribution, if you take the usual limit to try to get the continuous distribution, that blows up. So the whole formula you see in uh, Gibbs and elsewhere, you know, f of x, law of natural, f of x minus, this is only analog. This is not the continuous limit of the Shannon formula. So there's all sorts of ways in which the Shannon formula of all smart does a great job in its natural milieu, which is coding theory, giving you the lower bound on any average length of covers in any coding scheme. Huffman scheme is usually the best one. And logic has none of these problems. Logic always gives you this well defined in the case here of a uh, this one, so one minus is always going to be well defined. So, so the mathematically stable and easily interpretable notion of, of mathematical or entry logical content is the logical mountains run out of logic, has all these properties. Shannon entry is a transform of it. And the transform is actually if you take your space here, P, and this is 1 minus P, I, then you have the log natural of 1 over P, I. That's your trans the transform is for each, each P, I, is to th take this, which is a measurement of gets, and work it out and substitute this. So if you take any formula in logical entry, just take the simplest formula for logical entry. So the, the uh, logical entry, small p of the probability distribution, one minus the sum of pi squared, which equals the sum of pi times one minus pi. Then the dead bit transformation substitutes for this, one minus the i, this up here gives you the, the sum pi, the average log natural one over pi. And that is precisely the change. So that's your dead transform represented graphically just moving from here to here. And this is one of the fundamental inequalities of most of the problem. And this is what's used to prove this. It's basic problem. Okay, so the And then, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, the, this notion of logical entry extends directly to, uh, to uh, quantum version. So the entry of a density matrix is 1 minus a trace of rho squared. The, the von Neumann entry is minus this uh, trace Rho times log natural rho there. And this, the logarithm of the matrix. So if you want to prove anything about this, it's, it's, uh, you've got to do some work. But it is true that if the 
density matrix is for your shape, then the the one well, entry is zero. What's the logical entry of a pure state? And that requires a bit of a proof in the von Neumann case. So what's the logical entry of a pure state? Pure state means rho squared equals rho, trace of rho is one, one minus one is zero. So this is the, comes out totally simple. So here, mathematically, you're cutting at the joints now. Proofs are very simple to do. Now, what I'm, and that's, that's the, the fundamental theorem, by the way, of logic for mashing is when you do the Linder's mixture operation to represent measurement. So you have your, your uh, row hat, your post measurement equals the sum of your over your eigenvalues, the projection matrices down to the eigenspace, go psi projection matrices. <clears throat> so the so this this could be a pure state, in which case this is zero, and then you get a mixed state out of an opposite here. This could even be a mixed state. So the question is, how do you relate? This changes of this density matrix to the mashman. And we already know that. We know that the off mashman makes distinctions. So it takes the off diagonal elements that are now in different eigenvalues, the zeros of them. Because they're, they're ones that are split between two different eigenspaces, so they get wiped out by this, these projections here. So the the uh, so you have your take your density matrix now. Expressed in the in the uh, represented in a for normal basis for the observable would be measured. So you have your density matrix. You have your probabilities down here, and then you have your off diagonal elements here. And and the question is, uh, how can I relate the changes in the density matrix from here to here? So very simple. You take all the elements that got zero, all the off diagonal elements that got zero in the measurement, absolute square, add them up. All right? That equals the, the uh, difference in the logical entry. So you have a direct relationship between the changes in the off diagonal elements representing indistinctions being turned into distinctions in the measurement is directly reflected in just the difference in logical quantum logical entry between the end state and the end state. So that's the shows you how how logical entry is directly related to measurement. Nothing like that holds for for von Neumann entry. Von Neumann entry increases with projected measurement. There's no no relation between it and what actually goes on in the off diagonal elements of the density matrix. So this is directly tracks what goes on with the off diagonal elements. Okay, so that's a lot of sort of saying this these mathematical notions help to interpret uh, set partition gone up. Uh, what are the other ways in which partitions come into mathematics? And the uh, another very fundamental way they come in is, of course, in group representation theory. So what is a group representation on a set, a set representation of a group? If every, when, when the action of the group is to take one element to another, that's like identifying. So that's like saying these two things are symmetric. They're going to be identified by this. And what's the partition that then identifies all the things that are symmetric? Well, that's the orbit partition, the orbit partition of the group. Then you go up to the to the uh, uh, vector space uh, version of that, so you have a group representation of vector space, particularly the complex numbers, and then these the orbits are then replaced by the invariant subspaces, and you have a direct sum decomposition of the, the uh, invariant subspaces, and the group representation is the whole space. So the whole thing just uh, goes up to the vector space case. 
So this is part of the seeing how this mathematics works when you linearize it. So you start with sets, set partitions, you know, uh, real value, numerical attributes, and so forth, and you then lift it all up to vector space. So the set partition linearizes to a direct subject decomposition of the vector space, real value attributes linearize to, to uh, self adjoint operators. And that's very simple. It's just what, what is the information content in a self adjoint or information operator? Given the set, which is an orthonormal basis for the operator, information is the operator. It's just given by a numerical attribute on that set. Take that set as a U, take a real value uh, numerical attribute on it, that defines the operator. It, it, it turns around and gives you that because you, you just use the eigenvalue equation. So this is the way all this gets linearized. The mathematics of sets gets linearized in the mathematics of vector spaces. Partitions become direct sum decompositions. Set representations of groups become vector space representations of groups. And the orbits become the invariant subspaces. And so then the question is, well, what is so-called quantum logic? Well, this linearization takes subsets to subspaces. So the original idea that we're talking about the quantum logic is to just make that transition, to do the logic of subspaces of the vector space, in particular when the vector space is a separate filter space. Now that is what, that's what, you know, what is it, uh, 60, 70 years ago, uh, they did that, that uh, paper, and so you've got all this development of, of quantum logic, people publish books and papers and continue and everything on quantum logic. And uh, what is the impact of that on the foundations on better understanding of quantum mechanics? Well, not much, it's already hardly mentioned. But what we know now is that all this dualizes. So the dual of the subspace is a direct sum decomposition. So you have logic, quantum logic of direct sum decompositions. And that's also been published here. And so we have the usual form of quantum logic, and we have the dual form of quantum logic, just like we have the usual form of logic of subsets is, is the dual, the uh, logic of set partitions. So uh, that's, and, and when, you, when you have the logic of, uh, of, of direct sum decompositions, you can reproduce a lot of the more sophisticated notions quantum theory just using that, that machinery. For example, the, um, we talked about before, what is the join? And the join to partitions is the partition of the intersections that are not zero, not empty. So if we have two direct sum decompositions of, of uh, of the vector space, what would be the join of two direct sum decompositions? Well, the natural definition would be just take the intersections of the, you know, the subspaces for each one, which are non-zero. Zero is at all. So if you have you think of zero, and then you have the sort of vector spaces whose direct sum gives you the whole thing, and you have another one different way, and you, you just take the, the uh, and think of each of the spaces on this as a, as a eigen, space of eigenvectors, different eigenvalues, and you take the join, well, it would be the, the uh, set of non-zero overlaps of those spaces. So what is that? Well, the, it's, it's the, what is the end each of those spaces is the simultaneous eigenvectors for the two, if they came from operators, is the simultaneous eigenvectors. So just using these direct sum decompositions, how do we reproduce the notion of community operators? Well, the theorem is that this space is spanned by this intersection of subspaces, the space spanned by the simultaneous eigenvectors <coughs> is the kernel of the commutator. So what does it mean to say two operators commute? 
means the kernel of the commutator is a little space. So that means that this intersection of two direct subject compositions spans the whole space. If and only if the operators that have given you those direct subject compositions of like in spaces commute. So we reproduce the notion of commutivity in the logic of direct subject compositions. In effect, subspace, and, and thus you get the theorem, of course, that if the operators commute, then the, you have a basis of simultaneous eigenvectors. Like you said, simultaneous eigenvectors like span the whole space. If they don't span the whole space, then they are about. And the opposite is if the space they span is zero, then they're conjugate. So all these notions you internalize just in the logic of direct sum decompositions, commuting, incompatible, conjugate, all come out there in just the logic of direct sum decompositions. Okay. So, so the answer I'm trying to give here is that the insightful mathematical machinery to answer our original question, what is the natural mathematical way to deal with indefiniteness, indefiniteness, not the wave function, it's the density matrix. You see all the diagonal elements of density matrix tell you exactly what is indefinite. Two, two things that being smooshed together, smeared together, whatever language you want to use, is that. So the Shimoni interpretation about objective indefiniteness the natural mathematical way to think about it is not to think in terms of wave functions, but think in terms of density matrices. And we all know that quantum mechanics can just as well be formulated in terms of density matrices. So this gets back to my remark of take the math seriously and see what the math tells you about what's going on. And it tells you that we're dealing here with indefiniteness given to you by this by the off-diagonal elements and density matrix, whereas the wave functions don't say that. It's all there, the information is all there, but in a different package. So when you use the wave functions to define density matrices, then that brings out immediately the objective and definite, the off-diagonal elements, and how they, how they behave. So the, and of course the general theme here is we should analyze quantum mechanics using the notions of distinctions and indistinctions. Distinctionability, indistinctions, those are the natural notions. Just a minute, I'm out. And, and so, um, one question that comes up is, what makes measured? And, and people have quite correctly said that if you try to analyze measure in terms of microscopic apparatus or macroscopic apparatus or the intervention observers, they, you know, they get nowhere. So, in this framework, the, the natural analysis of, of measurement is or it's a bad word, state, state vector reduction, is where Mother Nature can distinguish between the, uh, when you get a superposition point into an interaction, can they distinguish between what would happen if it's one eigenstate went through or the other eigenstate went through the interaction. And as opposed to the case where they cannot be distinguished which one, as it were, went through the interaction, the outcomes are indistinguishable. So, the, the, uh, what, what do you mean, mother nature? Well, I mean, let me, I don't, let me just, I, I just don't understand, I don't know how to think about that. I like, ask, can mother nature be answered why? I don't even know what questions to ask. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll get to this. If we can we interview multi well, mother nature in the form of finding. Um, <laughs> so the, you go back to von Neumann's two notions of type one process and type two process. So if distinctions or indistinctions are the way to analyze this stuff, then that should give you that distinction. Okay? So quantum, quantum states where you have some position have this unique property that two states can overlap. I, no, I, I'm sorry. What do you mean quantum states where every quantum state is the superposition of infinitely many pairs of other quantum yeah, states? Yeah, no. So you can't say quantum states where well, it comes to the depends on the basis you're looking at. So many mm -hmm. different bases, they can overlap. And the, so that if you want to have a transformation that makes no distinctions, then the extent to which, which uh, two states are distinguished or indistinguished has to be preserved. And the extent to which two states are indistinguished is the Dirac brackets. 
see over there. So the, so the type of transformation that doesn't make any distinctions is the transformation that preserves inner product, it preserves the direct product. So there's the type two by my process, and then the other type is where distinctions are made. So this sort of look at things in terms of distinction in this issue gives you the one moment distinction type one and type two process. And this is what Feynman brought out himself. So as you know, Feynman was rather disparaging of philosophers of physics that, that uh, was it there, physicists need philosophy of physics the way birds need orthomologists. And uh, yet Feynman, uh, I would argue, was actually thought very deeply about philosophical questions and often gave his answers in, in a, uh, uh, you know, in his text and elsewhere without really emphasizing them. So here is, here is Feynman saying, if you could in principle distinguish the alternative final states, even though you don't, and, and uh, we shouldn't even have you in there, because this is, if in principle they are distinguished, we're not talking about humans doing it or anything like that, then the total final probability is obtained by adding the probabilities, or computing the probabilities. In other words, you've got to imagine it. And, and if the uh, final states, after you go through this interaction, cannot be distinguished, then you add amplitudes. In other words, you've got the unitary propagation. So the sort of joke version of this is we have this seminar, American math professors at Riverside, and we all go to lunch before the seminar. So we're standing in line for the lunch, and I say, I'm in a superposition state between a pulled pork sandwich and a hamburger. So then we, we go along in this superposition state and decide which one, and finally we come to a, a interaction with the cashier. So Mother Nature is the cashier. And I say, you know, I'm in a superposition state between hamburger and pulled pork sandwich. And, and uh, Mother Nature says, I don't care. I can't distinguish them either because they're both 750. So just give me 750 and go on to the kitchen. So, the, so that's a measurement apparatus that didn't measure because it didn't distinguish. They both had the same price. And then I go on to the kitchen and I tell the cook, you know, I'm in a superposition super state uh, between hamburger and, and Mother Nature is now the cook. And she says, well, there, you know, I can, I can just difference between making a hamburger, making a pulled pork egg, sandwich. Of course, the professor's come out. She flips a coin and makes one or the other. So that's the, that's the idea. So uh, Feynman here is saying that if, if the final outcome of these states that are in superposition, they go through the interaction, can you distinguish? And so the example gives, the best example he gives, is, is where you have electrons scattering off the atoms in, in a uh, uh, crystal. And if you do that, and you cannot, not, excuse me, nature, where it's not, it, it cannot be, dis there is no distinction between which one is scattered off of, you add amplitudes, no magic is taking place. Then, it, then Feynman says, suppose they all have a spin up, and whichever one of houses all switches to spin down, then you can distinguish. Then you add probabilities, or you get computed probabilities. So Feynman is answering the question here of what is an effective measurement, what is the state collapse, vector reduction, whatever you want to call it. It has nothing to do with macroscopic. This is an electron scattering on a crystal. There's no macroscopic measurement thing. None of the Zen Zurich decompositions has anything to do with it. There's no macroscopic thing involved. And yet Feynman says, this is the difference between you and you add probabilities when you add amplitudes, because he's going you know, from A to B in his framework. So this is his answer to that question, but how do you distinguish when you add probabilities and when you add amplitudes? Can you distinguish the outcomes? Yeah, I'll give you a Maybe I'm misunderstanding. So in the toy model, there it was everything was clear because there's like a, there are sharp partitions, right? And um, you could say that like nature genuinely doesn't distinguish between different states. Is that if well, the, the things that are in a block of the partition are not distinguished by that numerical attribute. Right, so, so there's, so I guess I, I'm trying to understand when we transition to full quantum mechanics, how we can have like amplitudes of indefiniteness. Like I, I understand um, the idea of like partitioning 
estates into um, regions that are, each region is, the states in the region are indistinguishable from one another, but I don't understand how you can have indistinguishability or distinguishability between zero and one or a complex number. Well, we're trying to analyze the superposition state that makes sense. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the correct mathematical way to represent the superposition state in this interpretation of quantum mechanics, where I mean, we put it this way, the ontology is, is particles. But they're not your father's particles. They're the particles that have all these objective indefiniteness. And, and so the particle that has this uh, superposition, let's say two positions, slip one, slip two, or, or whatever it is, uh, the off diagonal elements will tell you uh, which which uh, states are, as it were, superimposed. And when you do a measurement, if they're separated, then those all take out, all get zeroed out, you're left with a mixed state. So if you want to know how that works in the, the toy case, mm -hmm. the amplitudes are the square roots. The, the, uh, so you have the cardinality of two, so these are, these are two subsets, you call this the same basis here, otherwise it wouldn't make sense to talk about the intersection. And the square root of this would be the, this uh, amplitude. So you, you, when you then do your squaring, you're trying to just get the size of subsets, and that's what classical discrete probability is concerned with, the size of subsets normalized. Mm -hmm. And of course, the normalization waits until probability time here. You can't normalize as you go along. But, Normalization waits till the last moment to be computed the probabilities when you normalize. So that all these papers are on my website and can sort of download it. So just to finish up on, on uh, uh, Shimoni had this relationship with Heisenberg. Heisenberg is usually brought up as, as a uh enthusiast, but actually he was uh, had his own little metaphysics going and he didn't have the self-confidence to discuss metaphysics on its own, so he always couched it in terms of his discussion of ancient Greek philosophy. And so his version was that when I guess nature superposition, those are like potentia, is the Aristotelian terms, and imagine and actualizes one or the other. And Shimoni unadvisedly picked up on that and, and uh, in some unguarded moments and, and uh, used that same terminology uh, I think that was a mistake because obviously uh, at any time uh, two things can have an actual effect as potential would in this language and the interference effects then they're actual. It makes no sense to have some different modality of existence in your, in your ontology. And, and uh, so I'm trying to give a version of, of uh, Shimonic's literal interpretation by saying that literally we have to take objective indefinite seriously, the mathematics of representing objective indefinite is the density matrix, not the wave function, and the concepts to use to analyze it are the concepts of distinction, indistinction, distinguishability, indistinguishability, all the concepts that come right out of the logic of partitions as opposed to the classical logic of substance. So that's it. I get nervous when the big reveal comes and it's God in the picture. Um, <laughs> the, 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 you use terminology about what can be distinguished or what nature can distinguish, which is a modal can. Take a regular two slip and suppose someone says, well, right after the particle passes the slits, there are two possible outcomes, going through slit one or going through slit two. Can I distinguish them? Sure, you can. Put the screen right in front of the slits. You get a dot. You get a dot here, it went through slit one. You get a dot here, it went through slit two. So then you say, oh, well, they can be distinguished, so now I don't use amplitudes, I have to use probabilities. And then you screw because then, then you don't get the interference effects when you move the slip back. So I, I just yeah, no, I just don't understand in, in, in any concrete way how to translate talk about what nature can distinguish into 
to. Now, in, in a, in a uh, what would be a, in effect a measure, it's where the two get distinguished. And in other words, nature has made the distinction, and then you add probabilities. And it's too slow experiment, then you wouldn't so, get the appearance. I mean, one way to put this is, is I always found, and most people do, on Neumann's presentations, despite the fact that it looks formal because it has axioms, right? It looks kind of mathematical to say that but it's still not math, but it's not physics because the axioms involve the word measurement, and as Bell said, that doesn't have any clear meaning. Um, it sounds like you're just using nature as a figure as a kind of analog for a measurement has occurred. And that, that to me is just an obscure phrase. It doesn't really think of this as a well-defined the, I mean, the one way to illustrate a concept is just to look at special cases. And uh, one case which I find illuminating is, is the one that several that Feynman uses. And, and the you know, one I talked about was the electron scattering off the atoms in the crystal. And, and if, there, if there's no distinction between which one is scattered off of, then it's unitary evolution. It's like I gave the cash register and both the option was 750, so there was no distinction made. And however, if there, you know, if there was a, all the all the atoms in the crystal had spin up, and, and the, which one it scattered off of would switch the spin, then it, well, then, let me try it this. Where is the distinction? Decoherence is an approximative notion. Sure. Right. So I send a particle into a crystal, and I just do unitary evolution, and the unitary evolution will have interactions between a bunch of different lattice sites that all be represented and they you know give me a huge superposition of states of, of having interacted with this one having interacted with that one having interacted with that one. Um, okay Hat. or I could I could reduce the thing at some point in there and replace that pure state with a proper mixture of the inter of interaction interaction. Now you say, well, can I distinguish those? Sure, it, it, that is in principle. Those off-diagonal terms that get wiped out when I move from the pure state to the mixture, in principle, can lead to empirical differences. And this, this was something Bell said. Bell said, uh, when responding to people who are trying to appeal to decoherence in exactly this way to make a distinction between what a measurement occurs, he says, uh, it's true that if you wait long enough and you fix on an observable, the uh, off diagonal terms will get as small as you like. But it's also true, no matter how long you wait, there will be some observable, such that the off-diagonal terms are as big as you don't like. Um, and I think that's exactly the situation. So that, that's just to say, I don't know when nature has distinguished things unless I already solved the measurement problem in some other way. It's not appealing to me. So I understand if I've solved that problem, I can use this apparatus. But I don't understand how I can appeal to the apparatus to solve the problem. I don't see what's, if you have, you know, scattering around the crystal, and you got so you have a path of going through, and you take the point before it goes into the crystal, and the point after it goes into the crystal, then is it distinguishable in principle which path it took or not? And now you might want to say, well, I could take the statistical mixture of all the different paths, and that would not be distinguishable from the superposition of all the paths. That's right. And that's about a thing. You've got to, to distinguish those, you've got to take a different basis. Measure it on a different basis. But the if, if we know it's going in in a superposition, and there's no way in principle that the which actual path it took is, is distinguishable, then you add amplitudes. No measure is taking place. And if it's the same, if there is a difference, like flipping the spin or whatever it is, then 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 you add probabilities. You go to the other people. So it's 
So I, I think Feynman had it right, and, and uh, this has nothing to do with Zen, Zen, and Zurek. That sort of decompos uh, decoherence is not part of that. And, and uh, so the concepts to use are, are, are uh, you know, these concepts of distinction and indistinction. And then you, you can go even more into the math. You can, you can, so I gave you sort of the derivation of why is when there's no distinctions made, do we have unitary evolution? Because that's precisely the, the extent to which two states are indistinct is their inner product, is, is the, the direct practice. So when there's zero indistinction, that means you've got full distinction, which means a product. And when there's, there's uh, full indistinction, normalized states, that means their inner product is one, that means they're the same state. And so then you get everything in between. So if there's no distinctions made by your interaction with whatever this thing is that your superposition is interacting with, uh, then you've got your material evolution. And, and uh, they just say, what about the Schrodinger equation? Well, of course, the connection there is Stone's theorem, where unitary evolution can be represented by a Hermitian matrix evolution. That's just math. Now, the math doesn't tell you that it's energy. That's empirical. The math does tell you that we've got unitary evolution that can be represented as this evolution of this Hermitian matrix, which turns out to be energy in charge of equation. You just made a distinction between when a distinction has been made and when it hasn't. Take the two slit interference with monitoring, but weak monitoring, coupled, coupled weakly your electron to something else. Um, and run the experiment. Now, have I made a distinction or not? No, because no, what evolves is the superposition between upper slit and your proton moving up, or lower slit and the proton moving down. So the distinction there is not made in that superposition until you hit the, hit the wall. And so that's made when you hit the wall? Hmm? Not made when you hit the wall? When you hit the wall, then it has to localize. But if, the, if the distinction is supposed to be between going through slit A and going through slit B, it's not made when it hits the wall either. If, if you have your type of monitoring that you talked about, that, that Proton went up and down. That postpones the distinction. That gets you onto different you know, branches of the configuration space. But the actual uh, state vector reduction comes from finding this, this the wall. And this is the same in Stair Gerlock, the same in Icelandic crystals. Stuff. Stair Gerlock is not a mansion. It does not, uh, the, the, the particles don't uh, get measured in one, go up one, one uh, you know, arm or another. What you get in the Stern Gerlach is a uh, superposition between entangling spin up and upper channel and spin down and lower channel. It stays in superposition until you find you do some sort of magic spin. And of course, if you do put your detector of spin in the upper channel, you only get you know, spin one way if you put it in the lower channel against it, because that's the way the entanglement, this is single particle entanglement, entanglement between different attributes of a one particle. Entanglement. And so many textbooks, you know, interpret the stereo block as measuring. It's not. Similarly, the crystal, the, the separated polarization, that's you're, you're entangling the two channels with the two polarizations, and, it, and it's still still in a superposition state. And that's why you can then have a loop. Feynman has the loop, stereo Gerlach loop, where you put two Stern Gerlach things together, and because it's not decohered, they can recombine, get rid of the, the spatial thing, it comes back out as the same superposition of the which could never happen if it actually been imagined.